they got us. They absolutely fucking got us. Coming out of last week, WWE made the announcement that Heyman is going to be the director of Raw, and Bischoff is going to be the director of SmackDown. We come into this episode of Monday Night Raw wondering what is going to be different about this show, if anything at all. And right off the bat, there was a little bit of difference. It felt like this was a different show at the start of the show. I'm not going to lie. We had no big, long-winded segment of a superstar coming out or superstars coming out, leading to a six-man tag later in the night. We started out with Bobby Lashley versus Braun Strowman in a Falls Count Anywhere match. And I'm wondering, how are we going to do a Falls Count Anywhere match that ends before the next commercial break? They found a way to do that because coming because we went about five minutes, maybe five minutes, and they go they're up at the ramp. They're up at the ramp. Bobby Lashley is hanging like hanging to where he's like sitting on the lawn area, the entranceway, and Braun Strowman just comes barreling in, taking him out, and you actually hear Corey Graves go, "Holy shit!" Without no bleeping, no nothing. They, and there was a bunch of sh- explosions. It felt like there was, like, I think they overdid it with the explosions. Everything just, like, blew up. It went pow, 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 blow up for a bit. Stopped for, like, a second and a half. And then kept going. And I'm like, it kind of overdid it just a little bit. However. And then, my another nitpick with this is that they held, they, they went to a weird camera angle that was behind, that seemed to be behind everything. In the backstage area, up, up high. And they just sat there for a while and just kept sitting there while the while crew and everything were trying to, you know, make this as safe as they can. So WWE did what they could to make this feel like it was a like this was real and that this was a big deal. We come back from commercial break and they're still hanging on to this. And I'm like, okay, I'll give them a I'll give them props because this first segment felt different. It felt like something like a, like there was change in this show. And then, wouldn't you know it, as soon as we get back and we get done with the whole thing with Bobby Lashley and Brock Strowman, who both get carted away, it's back to regular business. We had the Viking Raiders versus the New Day, which ended up going into a six-man tag match because that hasn't been done um, t- done to death. We had a two-hour three falls later in the show because that hasn't been done to death. And it was the Miz and Elias because that hasn't been done to death. We had Ricochet... And AJ Styles, again in the main event for the United States title. And oh boy, let me tell you when we get there, how they broke this up and went to commercial break. Because it just killed any excitement you had for that match. It was absolutely just despicable. Moment of piss segment with, with Nikki Cross. Led the match with Nikki Cross and Carmella. They had the 24-7 joke shit that I'm not getting want to get into. And before... The, and before the actual Falls Count Anywhere match, this was, I don't know if this was on purpose or Kevin Dunn's production got fucking stupid, but there was a flash-up of the Street Profits, Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford, with the tag team titles around their waist on Monday Night Raw. These guys just won the tag team titles for NXT at TakeOver 25 in that magnificent ladder match. And they're on Monday Night Raw just a couple weeks later, or like a month later. Why? Yes, I know. NXT is taped up all the way up to NXT TakeOver Toronto. I understand that. They did it for two back-to-back days. They taped all the episodes. We are on our way to that. We have about, what is it, six episodes left? Six episodes left of that, so we have six weeks until that. And in my opinion, I thought the Street Profits were only going to be tag team champions going into Tor- Toronto and losing them to the Undisputed Era or Gotten Sons or somebody else. So I didn't expect them to keep it for very long. But why in why did we have to see the Street Profits on this night? They didn't have a match. They didn't get hyped up. All you did was have that little flash, which I don't think was supposed to happen. You had them interviewed later in the night. And then they interrupted Paul Heyman, who got the biggest pop of the night. Yes. Paul Heyman, talking with, I believe, Cam- Charlie Crusoe in the back, got the biggest pop of the night. And by the way, they were in Dallas. They were the same exact arena that's going to host the G1 Climax opening night tonight. I wonder how the attendance was. I'm sure it was better than what we saw post-stomping grounds last week. But 
this show just uh, Dallas was an okay crowd. They did they did bring the excitement sometimes, but you had the street profits shown on this show, and I don't know why you would bring them up. Like if you want to bring them up in Philadelphia, where you're going to be for Extreme Rules, and I'm pretty sure the night after in Philadelphia at the Wells Fargo Arena, whatever. You want to bring them up there? Fine, that's a smart mark town. Not really. Dallas is not really a smart mark town. They didn't get much reaction, if any at all. I mean, yeah, Paul Heyman got this huge reaction when he was shown on the big screen. Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford came into the screenshot, and they did nothing but harass and like get like make fun of Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman. That was that. Would it have killed you to give us instead of doing that? They do their own like you know. Play their, their own video series in NXT. Would it have killed you to have those video packages like that play on Monday Night Raw going into the next few weeks and then they make their debut after Extreme Rules? Did they really, really, really have to make their debut tonight? No, they did not. I have another question. Why when the Viking Raiders made their, when they made their WWE debut on Raw after the, during the Superstar Shakeup when they were NXT Tag Team Champions still... They didn't have the tag team titles for the two or three weeks, the three or four weeks after they came up. But when the Street Profits make their debut on the main roster, they had they had the tag team titles. Be consistent, WWE. It's either you acknowledge NXT or you not don't acknowledge NXT. This made no fucking sense. Again, why did the Street Profits have the tag team titles around their waist, but the Viking Raiders did not when they came up? And we're called the Viking Ex- <laughs> I can't even say that word. I can't even say that name because it was so goddamn awful. So this show, Cookie Cutter Paint My Number show. We did have The Undertaker, and I'm just going to say this. When The Undertaker's music used to hit from 2000, because I didn't get back into Monday Night Raw until 2003. From 2003-ish to 2014, anytime The Undertaker's music hit, I would start getting chills. I'd be like... Oh, this is gonna be great and awesome. And then he lost the streak to the then he then he lost the streak to Brock Lesnar. And anything special about the Undertaker going out the window. I have no desire to see the Undertaker wrestle anymore. I have no desire to see Undertaker in the ring anymore. And his fucking promos have a, have regrets so badly. He, I know, yeah, he talks low and is brooding back in the day, but it's just not the same anymore. The Undertaker has got to retire. Tonight was more evidence of that. I'm literally sitting here. I have a fan right here. I was literally sitting right there and going like, oh, 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 is the Undertaker on? Oh, okay. That's that's what I was doing. Literally leaning on the side of my fan right here because it is fucking hot in Ohio right now. It is humid to tell, and that's why I have this little fan here to, you know, you know, do this every once in a while. But, yeah. I'm literally leaning there with my face just like trying not to fall asleep while the Undertaker's talking. That's how boring he has become. Let's see here. They did play it. And the thing about the... And here's something else. From, the, from after the accident, between after the segment between Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley, until I believe the Undertaker, Drew McIntyre, and Shane McMahon segment, at least three or four times they would beat you over the head with how serious this is. It's fine if you do it once or twice, but you don't have to keep doing it through the entire show. It's just like, hey, look what we did in the first 30 minutes. Now let's tell you about it over and over and over again. Yes, I know usually in Monday Night Raw, if something big happens like The Undertaker returning last week, they'll tell you if it's in the middle of the show, they'll show you before the main event. But they taught, They had The Miz say something, they had Shane McMahon say something, they had Michael Cole, Corey Graves say something. It was just, what the fuck are we doing? Becky Lynch, Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins' relationship, my I tell you, is some of the worst television I have ever fucking seen. I don't give a fuck what they do behind closed doors. I don't give a fuck... What they do when they take off, when the when the personas go away and they're Kobe Lopez and Rebecca Quinn at home. I don't fucking care. But pushing this agenda of having Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins on this show tonight was absolutely some of the worst television I've ever seen. And on top of that, 
you had Mike, Mike and Maria Kanellis come doing their interview to challenge them to a match. And I, 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 I missed the majority of that match because I had to take a, um, I had to take a bath, I had to go to the bathroom. I came back, and Maria is pretty much just embarrassing Mike Kanellis or Mike Bennett all over. Like, I'm pregnant. I don't know how because you're not man enough to get me pregnant even though you guys already have kids. And pretty much just demoralizing Mike Kanellis for whatever fucking reason. And the thing, these two signed a five-year contract. A new five-year contract. And you're going to have this on TV? What a load of shit. I was like, I came back from the bathroom. I come in here and I'm like, what is this garbage? What is that? What is that? Oh, that's the ratings going down. You had somebody, you had people on, on online talking about, oh, in the Heyman era, this is one of the best episodes of Monday Night Raw. It's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is not Paul Heyman's era of Monday Night Raw. It's not going to be Eric Bischoff's era of SmackDown Live. It's the Vince McMahon is the one in charge era. Vince McMahon is still in charge. The buck stops with Vince. Everything goes through Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon's going to just sit there and be like, that's a good idea, but let's do it this way. Oh, that's not good. I'm going to do it this way. Nothing Paul Heyman or Eric Bischoff suggests is probably going to be found on TV. Now, granted, the first, 30, the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes of the show felt a little bit different. It did feel like Paul Heyman might have had a little bit of talking to that. Maybe that was him, him setting that up. I don't know. But outside of that, the rest of this show just felt like this. It, it felt like I... It felt like they were starting the show with this episode. It felt like the July 1st episode of Monday Night Raw got cut off and they just placed in last week's episode of Monday Night Raw after that first commercial break because everything after that first segment was just trash. The fact that you have people on Twitter talking about this was a great show, this was the best, sh they, like the last three weeks have been great. No, they have not. Raw is in the shitter. Raw has been terrible. It's continued to be terrible. And I don't know what else to tell you, but this show was just so fucking bad. The forcefulness of having Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins on TV as a couple. Rebecca Quinn and Kobe Lopez, I'm happy for them. I don't care what the fuck they do, but keep them away from each other on Monday Night Raw. It's like, you can have these two be individuals. We don't have to have their relationship defined on Monday Night Raw. And some, uh, on Monday Night Raw. Now, yes. But what about The Miz? Him and his wife... Um, we're on TV together a lot because they have a natural chemistry on TV that they they mesh well together. Daniel Bryan and Bree, for the little bit they were meshed well together. This right now feels forced and makes you question: Are they actually even in a relationship? They don't feel like a relationship. They feel like they're just friends pretending to be in a relationship. I don't want to say that. I don't want to be that guy. But that's just what I feel. From Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch. It just feels forced. It does not feel like a legit relationship. And I can't say anything else about it. This is just... Uh, I don't get why they did the Mike and Maria shit tonight. That is absolutely garbage. Had uh, the Shane McMahon show for another 20 minutes of fucking TV time. With The Undertaker coming out. Cutting a piss poor boring promo. Nothing about this show was good. And then... And then in the main events. What do they do? We have AJ Styles early in the night, which I like the promo that happened here. We had Gallows and Anderson in the back, you know, stirring the pot, making, like, talking to Ricochet, then talking to AJ, like, getting into AJ's head. He goes up to Ricochet, challenges him to the title. Rick Ricochet's like, well, I like how you fired up, so I accept. But AJ <laughs> slaps him across the face, and then Ricochet's like, I'm not holding that down, and he's going to slap him right back. So I like that interaction. That was pretty fine. We get to the main event. How I'm like, how are we going to do this? They go to commercial like ten forty five. Ten forty five. They go to commercial. They come back from commercial. We get a five minute match. AJ hits a phenomenal forearm. Ricochet clearly gets his leg under the bottom rope. One, two, three. What the fuck? Then I believe it was referee John Cone comes out, and him and the referee and the other and the referee for the match talk it out. We go to commercial break, we come back, and Gallows and Anderson are out there for some reason. Where do you fucking think this is going? So, we come back, there's six minutes left in the show. 
about six minutes left in the show. We wasted four minutes because they don't want to have wrestling in between commercials. Hey, Vince, you on Tuesday showed what you could do to prevent that. What did you do for Nikki Cross versus Bailey last week on SmackDown? What did they do? Give me a second. Got tea in here. I don't know anything else. But what did they do? Oh, oh, that's right. They went to picture and picture. Commercial down here, the match up here. You can do that on Monday Night Raw. You don't have to do this. Oh, well, we're going to have a two out of three falls match. We're going to do a commercial break after the second fall, which just spoils the fact that you're not going to have someone go too straight. Why? Why? Why would you have AJ be teased with the fact that he's going to go and win the U.S. Championship only to, no, 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 he fucked up. The referee fucked up, so we're going to change that. Where was this other referee for Samoa Joe versus, a- versus Rey Mysterio at Money in the Bank? Where is the continuity for your fucking referees? You had, you had the, uh, John Cone, I believe it was, come out and tell this referee, no, a- Ricochet's foot was under the bottom rope. Why didn't you have a referee do that at Money in the Bank? Why? Oh, because Samoa Joe's nose was broken. I don't fucking care. You had a worse situation because the referee was counting the pinfall, could see it right as day that, oh, look, his shoulder was up. But he still counted the pinfall anyway. This has been some of the worst television ever. And, oh, yeah, we get to that. We have about a six-minute match that is piss-fucking poor. Ricochet and AJ Styles could go 25, 30 minutes easy and give you a fucking five-star classic. They can't on Monday Night Raw because we're not allowed to have wrestling during commercials anymore and we're not going to use picture in picture. So, what happens? What happened three years ago in this same situation? It wasn't a match, but what happened three years ago? What happened three years ago in the middle of a Monday Night Raw ring when AJ Styles was standing in the ring with a certain wrestler and the club came down to confront them? What happened? Oh, that's right, it was John Cena and AJ Styles, and it looked like we were going to have Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson fight on um, AJ Styles and John Cena, fight those two off. But no, what happened? Punch right to John Cena's face, and the club was born. They went back to the well and did the exact same fucking thing for this tonight. The only difference is is that Ricochet got hit with a, a, a super Styles clash off the middle rope. Yeah, three years later, something that WWE killed with the brand with, with the draft in 2016 for what other reason other than they just could for this. And by the way, Gallons and Anderson were on SmackDown Live last year when they went over in the Superstar Shakeup at the same time as AJ Styles. So why didn't they do the club last year? What we trying to do because we know Gallons and Anderson are not going to resign with WWE. They're going to leave and do whatever the fuck else they want to do, whether that's go to Jacksonville or go back to Japan, go to Ring of Honor, go to Impact Wrestling. I don't know. All I know is this is their final run, and they're going to be doing the club again. I don't mind seeing AJ Styles turn heel. AJ Styles can be a good heel, great heel. And honestly, they, I was honestly expecting this to happen with Seth Rollins and AJ Styles going into SummerSlam, where you would have Seth Rollins and AJ Styles with Seth, well, AJ Styles being a heel against Seth Rollins, but that didn't happen. I'm fine with it, but they've got to find a diff- they should have found a different fucking way to do this. This has happened already. We did it with John Cena in 2016. Why are we doing the same exact angle this year? Makes no fucking sense. This show was just, I don't know what else to say, but this show was not a good show. Now, we come back from commercial break. Paul is playing up the seriousness of the situation. We see Braun Strowman loaded into an, uh, Bobby Lashley loaded into an ambulance. And I'm wondering, how in the hell are you going to have Braun Strowman, the guy, the guy's size, put onto a, onto a gurney and put into an ambulance? Let's see here. Bobby Lashley has already been driven away. Cole talks about how they will be taken to a local hospital. Yes, they actually, in, in the first hour, said hospital, and you heard holy shit from Corey Graves. So I was like, oh, there's change coming. It's just, it's getting there. 
Grace talked about how there was something burning in the back from the explosion. We go to the announce table. Alex Cole addresses the fans over how WWE tries to do everything they can to protect the superstars, but sometimes things like this happen. They continue to play up the situation as we go to replays. Cole says he hopes to have an update later. And then we had the Viking Raiders versus the New Day. This match went about two minutes. And what I was thinking is, how are we going to do this? How are you going to have the Viking Raiders take out on the New Day? Are you going to have the Viking Raiders job out the New Day? Because the Viking Raiders, if you don't know, has not had a pinfall or a submission loss at all in NXT or in Monday Night Raw. So are you going to have these guys lose like that? Match ends when Samoa Joe attacks Woods at ringside and puts him in the Coquina Clutch. Champion Kofi Kingston runs down to make the save. This turns the Raiders and Joe attacking Kofi. Together at ringside, Biggie and Woods are back over to face off with the others. Officials get between the two sides as we go to commercial break. What did you expect? A six-man tag match. And people are wondering, when did the Viking Raiders turn heel? The Viking Raiders have been heel since they came to Monday Night Raw. The first night they came in, they went up against the tag team champions who were the... Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. Yes, they came out and they did the war, 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 war. But they were set up to be heels. They have been heels the entire time they've been on Monday Night Raw. If they are utilized right, the Viking Raiders could be great heels. I have never seen them do be heels. They were in What Culture Pro Wrestling back when it was still WCPW. And they were babyfaces. Here's a good match. If you want to see a great fucking match with the War Raiders, the Viking Raiders, the War Machine... Go check out, if you can find it, the Swords of Essex versus the War Raider, the War Machine, which was Will Ospreay, and I can't remember who his friend, who his um, tag team partner, um, who the guy he was teaming with was. Go watch, if you can find that match, the Swords of Essex, which is Will Ospreay and, fuck, I can't remember his other name, versus War Machine for the WCPW Tag Team Championships. If you can find that match, just that match was Will Ospreay's partner goes down with some kind of undisclosed injury. I believe he, like, dislocated something. Will Ospreay put on one of the best performances in a two-on-one handicap match, and damn Neo won that match. That was just fucking awesome, what the War, what the war Machine at the time did with Will Ospreay. If you want to see what a great match, go check out Will Ospreay and the Swords of Essex versus the War Machine. You will ju- You will... If you don't like the War Raiders yet, uh, the Viking Raiders yet, you will love, you will, you will enjoy them after that match. That is definitely a must watch if you haven't seen it. After break, and we get a six man tag match. This match does not go very long. The Viking Raiders and Joe win after, of all people, I'm sitting here, I'm watching this match, and I'm like, four, three people cannot lose in this, four people cannot take a loss in this match. Joe, Kofi, because they're facing each other at Extreme Rules, and the Viking Raiders. Biggie and Xavier Woods would not be hurt from getting taken out in this match and lose. But what do they do? Go on Paradise to one of the more ra- um, Viking Raiders. Kofi comes from behind with a... Uh, I'm sorry, no. Joe comes from behind. Gets Kofi in the Kikina Clutch in the middle of the ring. Kofi tries to break the hole, but he starts fading. Referee calls the bell as Kofi Kingston, two weeks before his match with Samoa Joe at Extreme Rules, Fades to the Kakina Clutch. Who do you think is going to win that match at Extreme Rules? Moa Joe is not winning. By the way, during this match, Kofi Kingston, not Kofi Kingston, Corey Graves said there's rumors going around that this Moa Joe Kofi Kingston match is going to be a ladder match. Why? Why would there be a ladder match between these two? That makes no sense. By the way, Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch versus Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans is now going to be an Extreme Rules match. Why? That one makes no fucking sense. How you? I can honestly see Becky Lynch hitting Baron Corbin with the kendo stick, or Lacey Evans trying to take out Seth Rollins with the kendo stick. But why? Why would Samoa Joe versus Kofi Kingston end in a ladder match? Be a ladder match? It makes no fucking sense. Bring on here. Let's see. Bias was the mid throughout a few falls. Plus Becky Lynch and Seth Rollins will be here. Blah blah blah. We go. We look at how Drake Maverick recently lost the 24-7 joke at his wedding. Then, wedding. We see Drake is at Raw now with his wife, Renee Michelle, who has a uh, a sleeping mask on and ear, ear, and, ear, and um, noise-canceling headphones. You're supposed to be on your honeymoon. 
and you're spending it with Monday Night Raw? If I'm Renee Michelle, I'm calling for a divorce. I literally want a fucking divorce. Why the fuck would you bring me to this garbage show? Thomas is a honeymoon is soon, but he takes off the blindfold. Often she's not happy there at Raw. She, he says it's a quick start, but he says he's obsessed with the title. Then it's either her or the 24-7 title. Drake says, of course, he picks her because he loves her and won't let anything get in between them. They have, but Drake is distracted by uh, Truth, who is standing there with the title. Truth talks Drake and walks off. Back from break, and AJ Styles is backstage with Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. They talk about AJ getting a title shot from the United States champion, Ricochet. Anderson doesn't believe AJ can beat Ricochet and puts his hot Asian wife on the line. AJ gives props to Ricochet and apparently takes Anderson's bet. AJ walks off. Why did you want to... First off, Anderson, Gallows, and AJ are all happily married men, so why the fuck would Gen Anderson put his hot Asian white on the, on, wife on the line in that situation? No one, Jose versus Cesaro. We go to ringside and out comes Jose, and I'm like, why are we wasting Cesaro? Uh, talent, Cesaro's talents on a bum like No Way Jose. He deserves better than this. We see Drake Maverick and his wife at ringside watching the show. WWE, like, the, we see our truth in the conga line. Dancing around, taunting Drake and dancing with his wife. And then Truth just takes, like, the, the, he just gets to the barrier and just lays on the barrier. Oh, no, she about me. Drake gets up, his wife gets up and is like, you better not fucking even think about it. Drake sits back down, so our truth comes off looking like a fucking dick. You, Drake Maverick, which, you, you take what you can. Superstars come out chasing off Drew. Um, Cesaro attacks Jose to start and just hits him with a neutralizer on the outside. Not happy at all. And as I said, we're wasting Cesaro's talents on this match. And obviously Cesaro agreed with me because he was not happy about that. Cesaro Cruz goes backstage with the NXT Tag Team Champions Montez Ford and Andrew Dawkins, the Street Profits. They do promos to announce their arrival saying they brought the swag to Raw. They sing, about wanting, they sing about wanting to the smoke with the others on Raw. I don't even want to know what the fuck they're talking about. Maybe it's that type. Maybe it's the Mary Jane. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't even want it. Again, these guys didn't have a match. This was all they had was a promo and then another summer a promo with Brock Lesnar, with um, Paul Heyman later. Would it have killed WWE to have a promo package, a hype package, you know? Maybe do one of the street, the street talks that they do, you know? With the, the cell phone and everything that they do on NXT. That would have been fine. Why are you throwing them in there with no fucking reaction whatsoever? Street Profits are great. Montez Ford is fucking gold. You have him coming in. You have him showing up on Monday Night Raw. Not even going out to the live crowd at all in this show. Why? Why waste their time? Why waste their time? They just won tag team titles. They could have waited till after SummerSlam. The only times of the year that I accept I will be fine with them bringing somebody up and not having a promo package or a hype package for them is WrestleMania, the week after, the night after WrestleMania, or, two night, or the, the Monday or Tuesday after WrestleMania, or um, the Monday and Tuesday after SummerSlam because you usually are in the same town, the same building that you were the night before and the smart mark is still there. Possibly the Royal Rumble too. And that's it. Because usually the people who want to take over are going to that Monday Night Raw because you never know who's going to show up. So a lot more people are going to know who those guys are. I don't think half the people in Dallas even knew who the Street Profits were. That's not good. Jim McMahon and Drew McIntyre are up next. whoop de doo Come back and we see more replays of the opening explosion angle. The announcers play up the seriousness of the situation. Renee reports that both superstars will still be invalidated at a local medical facility. Cole promises another update later. Sarah Shepard is backstage with The Miz, and she also talked about this, so we're beating you over the head with the fact that, hey, this was a serious situation. Miz says he doesn't wish what happened to Strowman and last year on no one, but the WWE superstars put their bodies on the line each night. So again, beating you over the fucking head with the fact that what happened at the beginning of the show. Enough of it. Robert shows the beatdown of Miz from SmackDown last week. Miz cuts a promo on Elias ahead of the two out of three falls match and mentions The Undertaker might be here. Oh, by the way, did you realize The Undertaker might be here on Raw because they told us five or six fucking times? Too much. Way too much. Go to the ring and out comes Shane and Drew for another episode of the Shane McMahon Hour. Enter the ring and Rome gives him the proper introduction, which by the way, Rome, don't do that again. Leave it to Hamilton because Hamilton does it well, you do not. 
Shane mentions that last is showman incident, which again, beating you over the fucking head with it. Over and over again. Let me just shove it down your throat that this was a big, important deal. My God, it just happened like an hour ago. We don't need to be fucking told again and again and again. Shane brings up Roman in last week's show. Shane says they had the perfect setup. It was going to be the demise of Roman Reigns. Shane shows us the footage of last week's two-on-one handicap match beat down in Reigns. He had a few words on Reigns, and Shane says he's focused on The Undertaker, the one who Reigns begged to come save him from this situation. Shane says he's looking forward to doing battle with Taker again. Shane says Taker surprised everyone on Monday, but there will be no surprises at Extreme Rules because he and Drew will put the big dog and the phenom in the ground. Taker says, um, Drew says that Taker is the greatest legend in the history of WWE. I will agree. Pre-2014 streak broken. Drew isn't an ordinary man. He is a hybrid of everyone's generation and of every generation. He's not afraid of Taker. He says he doesn't give a damn about Taker. To be perfectly honest, Drew says he and Shane heard a little rumor going around because we haven't been told four or five times tonight that The Undertaker might be here. The Undertaker might be here. The Undertaker might be here. Again, beating you over the head with shit like this. It's so annoying. Taker would be here and he can came just to fight. Fans start chanting Taker's name. Drew says that Taker is in the building. They want to march down the aisle and magically appear in the ring so they can look him in the eye and tell him he's not afraid. And he will see his legacy exterminated at Extreme Rules. First off, Superstar says they're not afraid of somebody and then when somebody shows up, they immediately leave the ring. Cliche. That's exactly what happened here. The lights start flickering. Drew and Shane look around. Thunder and lightning starts. Lightning hits the ring post. And I'm like... Oh, woo, woo, I'm so scared. Six years ago, this would have been like, whoa, shit, this is cool. Not anymore. I'm over The Undertaker. The bells toll. My grand entrance for The Undertaker begins. I was so hoping this would have been a midget just to make this a comedy segment just so I could crap on that. But no, it was the actual Undertaker who took 10 minutes to get to the fucking ring because he's 50 something years old. Shane and McIntyre look like they're getting ready to fight, but now it looks like they just want to leave. Taker stands at the ring steps as the lights come back up. Drew and Shane stare at Taker down from the arena over the barrier. Fans pop for Taker, which I just want I just want Undertaker to show up in silence. Nothing. Maybe that would give Vince McMahon the hint that we don't need the fucking Undertaker. Taker takes the mic and explains Shane's name. Stop doing that because he doesn't deserve it anymore. He's a senile old fuck who needs to go the fuck away. Taker says Roman never asked for his help. That's not who he is. But if Shane and Drew need answers to why, let Taker explain who he is. He is and has been the Reaper of Wayward Souls for a long time. And he's here to collect the souls of Shane and Drew. But Undertaker, didn't you collect Shane's soul at WrestleMania 32? Or am I missing something here? You beat him at Hell in a Cell. What else do you have to prove against him? Drew McIntyre, fine, whatever, but come on. Taker says Shane has his respect a little for a while. Shane gave him everything he had in Hell in a Cell at WrestleMania 32 and lived to tell it. But like most mortal men, he fell to his own greed and ego. Taker says Shane may be the best in the world, but where he's sending them will be nothing more than another couple of lost souls suffering the torment, of torture, and the ac- acrid strength of stench of death. I can't fucking pronounce that. And that will be for all eternity. He adds, Taker, yes, Taker says, Shane and Drew will never rest in peace. Drops the mic and cuts his throat. Does the whole ghost slash, which, you know, whatever. While staring uh, in the bell tolls again, as Taker music starts back up. So, I'm literally sitting here almost, like, ready to fall asleep. Tundra Taker's promos are meaningless to me now. Boring, contrived, same old shit. Blah, 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 oh, you're going to rest in peace, blah, 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 nothing threatening at all anymore. I don't care. Corbin is backstage with Lacey Evans addressing Seth Rollins ahead of one to take off. Corbin asks if Becky Lynch is worth it to Rollins, and then Evans turns around and starts discussing Becky. She also accuses Rollins of having wandering eyes and says he won't be able to keep his eyes. He won't be able to keep his eyes off of her tonight as she defeats Natalya. She sounds like a fucking robot. She sounds so... Fucking fake. I don't believe a damn word that comes out of this Lacey Evans' mouth because she just sounds so goddamn robotic and fake. Because Rollins will see that he he should have never put his faith in the man. 
Can we get the, can we just kill the man thing? Because the man thing is one one on its welcome. I'm just saying. Go back to the main and take care is still on the fucking ramp for whatever reason. That's his like raises on fish and shit and all that stuff and we go to commercial. Did we really need to see that? Did you really need to cut back to the arena and go, well, take her, just sit there in the, on the ramp. We're going to go have a promo with Lacey Evans and Baron Corbin that the fans are not going to be able to see because you're out there in the middle of the, out there e making your exit. So they're not going to know that Lacey Evans and Natalya are going on next. Again, more pointless shit that we didn't need to see. Natalya versus Lacey Evans, this match sucked all the way. <sighs> Evans with the, Evans wins the match. After Baron Corbin trips up Natalia, Natalia unloads with some strikes in the corner. Corbin distracts Natalia, allowing Evans from behind. Counters for two. Corbin trips her as she runs the ropes. Fans boo. Corbin Natalia turns her attention to Corbin, allowing Evans to take advantage with the woman's right. One, two, three. Blah, 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 blah. Back from uh, after the match, Corbin and Rollins and Becky look on from the back as Corbin and Evans celebrate the win as we go to replays. As soon as, I just hope we don't have the nightmare fuel of Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans winning that match at Extreme Rules. I hope this is one of those things where the match ends with Becky or Seth winning, and then we move on to something else for SummerSlam, because quite honestly, Lacey Evans is not ready, and Baron Corbin is never going to be ready. Ricochet is backstage with Kurt Hawkins and Zach Ryan, which Carla Caruso interrupts and asks her for a word with Ricochet. Friday and Hawkins leaves, go back to catering. He asked about last week's non-title loss to Ricochet, to Styles, and his comments from earlier. Ricochet says, facing AJ in the Raw main event was one of the biggest accomplishments of his career, and next time he knows he could probably win. Anderson and Gallows come in and taunt Ricochet. Ricochet goes on being confident in his abilities and beating AJ next time. Gallows says it's time to put Ricochet in his place. Ricochet isn't looking for trouble, but if he's down for a match, they can continue taunting. And, but, like, I, I, I want to defend the title, and they say, well, you had no trouble with us, but you will be in trouble the next, with um, someone else, and they walk off. Just, just so much cringe here, man, nothing is worth, not, you know, Dallas and Anderson are not resigning, Dallas and Anderson are leaving, so pretty much we're getting some kind of shield reunion type thing, only it was with the club, until they leave, I don't fucking know, all I know is... This entire Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff stuff, if it doesn't lead to any change, this show is just going to be abysmal forever. This is backstage walks in the ring, and we go to commercial back. We go back to commercial break. Back from break, AJ is with Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. He he confronts them. He's like, what did you guys say? They talk about Ricochet and AJ saying he's going to go to have a talk with Ricochet. They wonder, why is AJ going to talk to, going to talk about um, go talk to Ricochet. The guy who is a two-time U.S. champion, two-time WWE champion, you're going to go just have a talk? What is your edge? What happened to the AJ who would go slap Ricochet in the face and then accept the challenge? This leads to AJ stopping when he sees Ricochet backstage. Look at, he's like, you running your mouth? Are you really running your mouth? Well, I'm taking this title from you tonight. Ricochet says, well, I like your pep. Three, slap, slap, and AJ's like, it's gonna get good. Two out of three falls match, Miz versus Elias, and we have ourselves a two out of three falls match. A rematch from last Tuesday. The difference is no Shane McMahon outside the ring. Cole was like, we're going to go to commercial break after the second fall. Why would you say this? Why the fuck would you say this? You know, when you say that, it automatically tells you this is going to go to three falls exactly. We have had two out of three fall matches that go two falls straight, but why would you say this? <sighs> Back and forth continues. Cole announces that the next commercial break will happen after the second fall. Miz suddenly drops the last with a skull crush genetic for the one, two, three, and about two minutes flat. Last comes back in and Miz goes to work on his leg. Elias fights off the figure four. Miz keeps the aggressive um, going, but Elias hits a drift away for a quick one, two, three, and we have two falls done in less than five minutes. Ah, oh, my head hurts from this. After a break in the bell rings, we have the third fall. Miz wins with the figure four leg lock, popping out Elias. What does this prove? What does this prove? That the that Elias cannot win without the help of Shane McMahon. That's what this proves. What else is there? What else can I say? This this is just two out of three falls match. That's good. It has to go. 
stipulation matches like a false count anywhere, two out of three falls, last man standing, um, hell in a cell, cage match can only be brought out when it's deemed necessary. Having just a two out of three falls match every single fucking show just takes that match and makes it useless. Two out of three falls match, Johnny Gargano versus Adam Cole was deemed necessary because they wanted a definitive winner. None of these matches have any fucking meaning. None of them. None of them. And it's fucking stupid. This show was like, oh my god, they did something great. Oh my god, they did something um, interesting. They, uh, they felt more real than anyone. Jeez! Immediately. It swan dive as soon as we got back. As soon as that match with the, War of the Viking Raiders and the New Day went on, this show went back to cookie cutter, paint by numbers, WWE Raw, and it was garbage after that. His death line before getting before getting up as his music hits, and we go to replay. Blah blah. Back from break, and we show highlights of Baron Corbin versus Seth Rollins at the stomping grounds. Can we please stop even being mentioned of that show because that show was horrendous? Then we go back, and we get the cringe, one of the cringiest segments of the fucking night with. Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch. Rollins wishes a speedy recovery to Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley. Again, beating you over the fucking head with this fucking shit. God damn it, you don't have to fucking continue to do that. Billy congratulates Rollins and Becky on their stopping ground wins. Caruso asks about the Extreme Rules winners take all match, and if Rollins is impulsive, they joke about... Oh god, Becky Lynch sitting there like... <laughs> impulsive? I never, like, oh, I don't need to see this. Is and Maurice, again, natural chemistry. They come off as legit. Daniel and Bree come off as legit. Even John Cena and Nikki Bella came off a little bit more legit than this. This feels so fucking forced. I'm like literally beating myself in my head. Again, beating you. Over the fucking head with this fucking Matt Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch relationship. So pathetic. And then Maria Canales comes out for whatever fucking reason. Whatever reason. Says she has an issue with them being called the first couple of WWE. Runs down Becky and says she may have beat Ronda Rousey, but Maria pushed an eight pound baby out of her uterus. Because we needed to fucking hear that. She said Maria says she deserves that title. Mike Kanellis appears and Maria says Rollins has the only, only has the title because Mike hasn't taken it from him. They go on and Maria says, how about she bring her bitch and they will face Rollins in his next. Rollins says you done messed up. And that was that. We go to commercial. Uh, give me a baseball bat so I can just beat my... Mm, mm, mm. It's just so fucking bad. After commercial break, we get another look at what happened with the Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley because we just get to beat you over the fucking head until it's out. Oh my god. Apparently, Braun Strowman has a ruptured spleen and Bobby Lashley still being evaluated. I don't give a shit. Too much. If you would have left all the other things out and this was the first update we got and we had no other mentions of this um, segment, it would have been fine. But you just took a fucking hammer and just beat us over the fucking head and shoved it down a goddamn throat all goddamn night. No. 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 Becky Lynch says Rollins with Mike and Maria Kanellis. Who the fuck cares? This match did not last very long. Because Maria tweets from the floor and takes the mic. Maria says Mike promised her she could wipe, he could wipe the floor with Rollins. She says she should have known better because he can't even wipe the floor at home. She runs down Mike until Becky comes to bring her into the ring. Maria reveals she is pregnant. Everyone stops. Mike looks on shock from the apron. He asks how this has happened, and Maria doesn't know because she doesn't think he's man enough to get her pregnant. That got an O from the crowd, as you expect. Becky takes advantage of the stunned Mike and yanks him over the top rope to the mat, applying to disarm her to make him tap out. So, five years. I hope you like that five-year contract, Mike, because you're nothing but an embarrassment now. This is Mike Bennett, a guy that I heard so much about when he was in Ring of Honor. His time in TNA was good stuff. He comes here. The power of love. 205 Live. Yes. That guy should have been in NXT from day fucking one. 
Like Maria takes the mic in the ring and says she can't believe Mike is the father of her children. She waited and waited for him to grow up and take some responsibility, but nothing. But he's nothing but a disappointment. Maria says the only man here tonight was the man Becky. So maybe next time she'll ask Becky to impregnate her. Mike listens while sitting down on the mat. And Maria drops the mic and walks off, leaving Mike looking disheveled and stunned. Five more years. Five more fucking years of misery for Mike Bennett. Wow. Kelly Caruso is backstage and she doesn't know what to say. Paul Heyman is introduced as the advocate to Brock Lesnar. Biggest pop of the fucking night when he shows up because pretty much what was announced on Thursday last week when it was announced that he is going to be running Raw as director of the show. See the quotation marks in my hand. He's not going to be doing shit. Teases Brock Lesnar for the, um, the hundredth time. Until the Street Profits interrupt with some mic work, messing around with Heyman, going Montez Ford with his best Brock Lesnar. Montez Ford is gold, just saying. My problem is, is the Street Profits already deemed as a comedy team on Monday Night Raw because if they are, that is a damn shame. These guys are worth more than the comedy shtick that WWE is going to have them go through. Tonight, it just felt like they are nothing but a comedy duo, and I do not want to see that with these guys. These guys deserve better. Messing around with Heyman and somewhat taunting him, Heyman says he doesn't have time for this because he's a busy man, walks off, and they beg him to come back. They do some more comedy and walk off. I'm not happy about that. At all. That's what they're coming up to do, is just be comedians. Keep them down in NXT. Hunter, Hunter, please, do not let the Street Profits come up and just be a comedy act, because if that's it, then they're surely being underused. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross backstage, watching this become the Alexa Bliss's moment of bliss. We do not care. We do have Carmella come out for the moment of bliss. She comes out. While Carmella's coming out, um, Corey Graves is like, oh, I don't like when somebody interrupts Co a moment of bliss. And she's like, maybe you'll make an exception this time. Corey's like, what are you implying? Because everyone knows that Carmella and Corey Graves are dating now. Again, stop with the subtle hints. Stop beating us over the fucking head with real life relationships. When the curtain opens and they're out there, being performers, it's not Corey Gray, it's not the it's not the real life personas, it's Corey Graves and Carmella. They are not dating on TV. Until a couple weeks ago, Kobe Lopez and Rebecca Quinn were out of the limelight with their relationship. They bring it back in and now Seth Rollins and Corey and Becky Lynch have to be um a couple on the WWE's main roster when they don't need to be. Carmella pretty much says Bliss is playing cross and taking advantage of her, and that's not a friendship works. Bliss says Carmella is pathetic, trying to break them up. Bliss says oh, she used to be fabulous, but I bought it, and but now all I see you as is our true sidekick. S i d e c k i c k. Carmella challenges Bliss to meet her in the ring. Carmella marches down the ramp. Bliss is right behind her with the cross at her side. This match literally went one move. Roll up by Carmella for the one, two, three. The challenger to Bailey at Extreme Rules lost to a roll up in six seconds. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? To Carmella, no less. Why? Why? This woman is supposed to be facing off against Bailey at Extreme Rules, and you're having her lose like that in six seconds or less? Are you kidding me? Why? We go to commercial break, we come back, and it's Nikki Cross versus Carmella. Why? Why is this match happening? I, I don't get why this match was even made. What you could have did was, like, you didn't have to have Carmella versus Nikki Cross. You could have had Carmella versus Alexa Bliss, have them come out. This match will happen when we come back from the commercial break. We come back, and then they have themselves a five-minute match. This was Diva-esque. This is supposed to be the women's evolution. The women's evolution. Everyone's supposed to be getting equal share. Why was Carmella versus Alexa Bliss two seconds or six seconds? Nikki Cross beats Carmella with the swinging pose neck break. The the the, sw the pose, the swinging neck breaker. After about three minutes, what happened to the women getting more time on TV? This was garbage. Nikki Cross deserves better than this. I don't know what the fuck they're doing, but this is trash. Sarah Shebra approaches Alexa Bliss, Cro uh, Nikki Cross backstage, asks Cross how she feels now that the WWE Universe wants her to face SmackDown Women's Champion Bailey at Extreme Rules. Instead of Bliss, an angry Bliss interrupts and says no comment and rushes her off and gives Sarah, Sarah Shebra a dirty look. 
Drake Maverick wins the 24-7 joke of a championship by hitting our truth with his suitcase as him and his wife were about to leave when his wife went to go freshen up. Yes. Take it on take it on your honeymoon. I don't want to see it the rest of the month. Bring it back in August or 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 lose it in the ocean wherever the fuck you're going on your honeymoon and it never comes back. AJ Styles versus Ricochet. This pissed me off. This went about three minutes. Phenomenal forearm. Ricochet got his foot under the bottom rope and the ref counted three. Finding more and more ways to get to a final commercial break. There was ten fucking minutes left in this show. Ten minutes. When this match, when like when they went to commercial break. Ten minutes. It's a show on my clock. 11, 10, 15. And I'm like, okay, so we're going to keep going. And then you get this bullshit finish. AJ is celebrating. is now such a winner. The replay shows Ricochet's leg under the bottom rope. In comes John Cohn to... Talk to the original referee, the music stops, we go to commercial break, so we can get a commercial break in between this match. This was fucking bullshit. After break of the match has been restarted due to the bad call, they go out at Ricochet with a twist and ends the good before dropping AJ on his head. By the way, the club came out here during the commercial break. AJ tried to send them away, but they went around the ring just watching from different angles. And Ricochet ends up winning a four-minute match. Four-minute match. He hits, he, tra- he, ca- he comes off the top rope, but AJ counters, tra- they trade counters on the mat, and gets a pin to retain the U.S. Championship. After the match, AJ looks shocked as Ricochet takes the title and stands tall while the music hits. Music stops as AJ extends his hands for a shake in the middle of the ring. Fans cheer as they shake. We see Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson applauding from the ring ramp now, walking the two. They get to the apron. AJ looks on and have a few words with them. They say something to the, about the real AJ. Ricochet has himself in a pose like he's ready to fight. AJ just turns around, clocks him. They beat the fuck out of him. Magic killer. AJ with a super styles clash off the top rope, off the second rope. Fans boo. The club stands tall. They go back pounding at Ricochet as boos continue. And AJ t- puts a boot on Ricochet. They stand tall. And the rock goes off the air as the club hosing together over Ricochet as AJ declares, We are back. So for the next two months, two months, the club is back. Yes. The club is going to be over in two months if Gallows and Anderson don't resign, and I don't think they're going to. Oh, uh, this show. You had everyone's interest. It was down here last week. And we had the Falls Count Anywhere into the explosion, which apparently, to wrestle, apparently according to WrestleVotes, WWE has had a new set being built or being designed, so this was obviously them destroying the set. Anybody remember when Raw went to the HD LED boards for the first time and they had the, the Monday Night Raw original set and Triple H threw his sledgehammer through an obvious um, obvious um, projection screen and they, it looked so stupid. But yeah, that's why they did that. But af- after that and after the seriousness, it went <laughs> down the hill, down the shitter, and the writing should just continue to fall. This show sucked, these shows continue to suck, and nothing Paul Heyman or Eric Bischoff on SmackDown can do is going to save this shit. The only way you save these shows is if Vince McMahon gets out of the fucking way. Now granted, they probably have everything built up to SummerSlam. If I don't see change the week after SummerSlam to where we don't get a repeat of what we got this week over and over and over again, there's no saving this show. AEW is going to come in on Wednesday night this fall, and wipe the floor with SmackDown, Raw, and any other fucking WWE show outside of NXT and NXT UK. The show was terrible. It was always going to be terrible. The Heyman, the Heyman era is never going to come as long as he has to report to Vince McMahon. The only thing that they should do is they get a script made, because they script everything, they get a script made, they pass it on to Vince, Vince reads it, Checks with his sponsors to make sure everything in there is fine, and then hands it back. He's like, "Have a good show." That's all he needs to do, but he won't. That's your Monday Night Raw review for Monday, June or July first, two thousand nineteen. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitch and Twitter at the Front Club, and I will see you guys tomorrow for SmackDown Live. Let's see how they blouse that show up. Till then, my name is the Front, and I'll see you guys later.